Welcome back to another episode of Tobacco Road Hooper. This week I'm looking at another ACC team, the Pittsburgh Panthers. Last year the preseason poll had Pitt come in at 14th in the ACC with only Georgia Tech finishing below them. Some Pittsburgh commentators were predicting about a 9-11 record for Pitt within the ACC, which looking at the end of the year standings would have had them tied for 9th with Boston College. The prior year, Pitt finished 6-14 in the ACC and didn't play in the postseason. So I could see why everyone was uneasy, but Pitt surprised everyone. The Panthers made the NCAA tournament and posted their first 20-win plus season since the 2015-16 campaign. This is the first time they've made the tournament under coach Jeff Cable. While they started the year with no one on any preseason watch list, they finished with Jamarcus Burton on the first team All-ACC team and Blake Henson on the second team All-ACC. Jeff Capel was named ACC Coach of the Year. Nick Sibande was ACC Sixth Man of the Year. The Panthers earned their first AP Top 25 ranking since that 2015-16 season. The Panthers played an exciting play-in game against Mississippi State to make the NCAA tournament. It wrapped up with a 60-59 finish as Jamarcus Burton scored a go-ahead jumper with 10 seconds remaining. This game featured 21 lead changes, the most in any NCAA tournament in the past five years. Then they went on to Greensboro, where I got to watch their matchup with Iowa State live. Despite the fact that Pitt won an NCAA tournament game by 18, it was really rough to watch. After earning a 22-2 lead, the Panthers surrendered a 21-6 run thanks in large part to multiple scoring droughts of five or more minutes. They then committed more turnovers than they made field goals and got just 16 points on two of 15 shooting from their two leading scorers. Their luck ran out against Xavier though. Federico Federico, who was averaging 23 minutes a game and played 11 minutes against Iowa State, suffered a sprained MCL and left the game. After that, Pitt's defense just couldn't hold up. Every time they started a run, it was quickly ended by Xavier shooting and a nice run in the second half was ended by a technical foul on Jeff Capel. But even after that second round loss, it was still a surprisingly good season and Pitt fans really had something to be excited about. So what can they expect going into this year? Please remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Cue the music. Jeff Capel is back for his sixth season. In recent years, Capel's offensive philosophy has come under some criticism. Some have argued that his teams are too reliant on three-point shooting and that they don't have enough of a post presence. However, Capel has defended this philosophy arguing that is the best way to maximize the talent of his players. And after last year's run and an appearance in the second round of the NCAA tournament, I would assume these criticisms would at least be quieted this year. And if he can repeat last year's success, it would really start to silence the haters. Capel's defensive philosophy has been successful at the college level. His teams have been known for their stingy defense, and he has been named ACC Defense Coach of the Year twice. At the University of Pittsburgh, Capel's teams have continued to use a combination of full court and half court pressure depending on the matchup. As for the staff around Jeff Capel, they return Tim O'Toole, an associate head coach, as well as assistant head coach Milan Brown and Jason Capel, all for their sixth season. So this coaching staff has been together since Capel took over the program, and they're all part of what was last year's turnaround. With no one leaving, I'd say that's a positive going into this year. So who will Pitt have on the court to accompany this coaching staff? In the backcourt, at guard, 6'2 freshman Jalen Lowe comes in as the Pitt Panthers' highest rated commit in the incoming recruiting class. And he isn't done separating himself as one of the best players in his class and region. He finished out the spring winning the Fort Bend Independent School District Basketball Player of the Year honors at a ceremony in his hometown of Houston, Texas. He averaged 27 points per game and cracked the 2,000 point threshold for his career while leading his high school to a 35-4 record and a 14-0 mark this past season. He plays with so much vision 
and being able to pass the ball, being able to score the ball from the point guard position, his outside shooting has been a major strength throughout his ascension to a four-star prospect. He can really shoot the ball from three, off a catch and shoot, and off the bounce. So he'll really fit into Capel's three-point heavy offensive system. Inside, he's very crafty as a finisher, and he can finish at a variety of angles. He has a good floater game in that eight to 12 foot area. If he sees a shot blocker coming down and he doesn't necessarily want a challenge, he can get the floater up over them. And he's a physical finisher, not afraid to get his body into the chest of the shot blocker and sort of erase that potential for rim protection against his own layup. He can finish off the wrong foot at a variety of angles also. I'm guessing right now he slots in as the third string point guard, pulling limited minutes at the start of the year. But as he grows into the ACC, I could see him acquiring more minutes as long as his shooting translates well to ACC defenses. 5'10 senior guard KJ Marshall returns to Pittsburgh after playing last season with Mars Hill University. Marshall, who played for Pitt in the 1920 season as a walk-on, then he played for Garden City Community College and Mars Hill before returning to Pitt. I see him slotting in fourth on the depth chart for point guard, kind of getting a few minutes this year. I am glad though after walking out in 2019, he found his way back so he can graduate from Pitt. Six foot four freshman guard, Carlton Carrington, is a big combo guard with terrific size and upside to his frame as he continues to fill out and build up his body. He's a fluid open floor playmaker with the ball and he has a very good mid range and pull up game in the half court. He needs to keep getting more consistent as a three point shooter, but long term he possesses potential as both a versatile scorer and playmaker. Defensively, he moves his feet well laterally and should be able to defend multiple positions, especially as he gets stronger. Overall, he's a late blooming talent, big combo guard with a high ceiling. I see him slotting in, maybe as the third shooting guard. He can definitely see early playing time, but that will give him a lot of room to grow into the college game. Six foot three junior guard, Ishmael Leggett, transfers in from Rhode Island. Ishmael is a strong veteran guard with a balanced skill set. He uses his strength and craftiness to get in the lane and create for himself as well as his teammates, and he has shown the ability to be a weapon behind the three-point arc, so he can definitely find a green light to shoot in Capel's offense. He averaged 16.4 points, 5.8 rebounds, 2.4 assists, and 1.4 steals per game last season. He was inefficient from three-point range, but he was also forced to take a lot of shots for a team that was depleted with injuries. He's a guard who can penetrate, get open from the mid-range, and occasionally shoot from behind the arc. His experience is vast. He's played 87 games at Rhode Island, and he has two seasons of eligibility left. Right now, I see him slotting in as the starting guard for the Panthers, although I'm sure Dior Johnson and Jalen Lowe will be challenging him in practice for that spot every day. And then there's six foot three redshirt freshman guard, Dior Johnson. He's the highest rated signee under head coach Jeff Capel and the highest rated signee at Pitt since Steven Adams in 2012. He's one of the most talented ball handlers in his class. Dior is a unique talent who's speedy and shifty, although a bit undersized. Pittsburgh does get a showstopper if he makes it to the court. He has vision, great passing instincts, exceptional handles, plenty of quickness. He's great at running the offense without over dribbling. And he's also a talented one-on-one -on -one scorer who is tough to keep in the lane. Last year, the 18-year-old freshman pled guilty to strangulation and simple assault and was ordered to serve one year probation. He was later reinstated to the team according to the University of Pittsburgh officials and he returned to practice with the team with a red shirt for the rest of the 22-23 season. I haven't seen anything online about him not being on the team, so if he is there, I would expect him to slot in probably as the backup point guard or shooting guard this season. We'll see how his game looks after being sidelined for the year, although if harsher restrictions come down at some point, I wouldn't. Be surprised either. I can't find anything either way on what the ACC has said about his situation. Six foot six freshman forward Marlon Barnes Jr. is a wing from Cleveland, Ohio, who played for Brush High School, the same high school that former Pitt star John Hewley attended. Sadly, they won't reunite since Hewley just transferred to Oklahoma. He's an excellent shooter, though. Barnes has been playing varsity ball for Brush since his freshman year. He's got all the tools and physicality. He's got one of the prettiest jumpers. With more and more reps, he's going to get more consistent. He has length, great athletic ability, and not just for jumping, but actually for being able to use that athletic ability. I think that will be big for him at the next level. The thing is that Marlon, the sky's kind of the limit. You don't just get them at six foot six. I see him slotting in deep on the bench, maybe for the two yard spot, maybe a bit at the three, but I don't see a lot of minutes from this year. I think he really will get a chance to grow into the role. 
six foot three sophomore forward Vasan Stevenson walked onto pit last year, and I still see him slotting into a deep bench role, hopefully getting some minutes near the end of games that Pitt is clearly winning. And six foot four freshman forward Benjamin Mayhow also walked onto the team. In the front court, six foot six redshirt junior forward Zach Austin transfers in from High Point University, almost 900 points and f- over 400 rebounds, while adding over 100 block shots. He's a versatile and productive forward with the ability to make an impact on both ends of the floor, and he has an outstanding athlete with strong rebounding and defensive instincts, along with a solid shooting stroke from behind the three, which again fits Jeff Capel's offense. Last year, he averaged 14.1 points, 5.4 rebounds, 2.1 blocks, 1 steal in 31 games, 26 of which he started. I would not be surprised if he slots in as the starting small forward for Pitt to start the season. 6'11 sophomore forward Jorge Diaz-Graham played in 31 games last season starting one. He shot 32% from the floor, 35 from three, and 75 from the line while adding 2.9 points and 2.2 rebounds per game. He will be out for an extended period this summer with a foot injury, according to Jeff Capel, but it won't be long term. Supposedly it was about a six week timeline, and that return would mean that he's back around the end of August, which is well before the start of the season in October. He saw an uptick of playing time during the postseason when Federico Federico dealt with his knee injury. Coach Keepel said that Jorge and his twin brother, Guillermo, a pair of lengthy stretch forwards, opted not to play for their national teams and spent their summers instead adding mass. Those changes in the weight room, it'll be interesting to see how it pays off next year. I still project him as the third string in the four and maybe the five spot. I would love to see him earn more playing time. At seven foot, sophomore forward Guillermo Diaz Graham played in 33 games starting three. He averaged 3.5 points, 3.2 rebounds per game while shooting 44% from the floor, but struggled to stretch the floor shooting 25% from three. Like I said for his brother, they took the summer to add mass, which could completely change their game for next year. Against Mississippi State, he showed he could hang with a defender 40 pounds heavier than him for a game, but I don't think it looked that easy for him. With more size, he can be a much more effective five this year. The thing is, is watching him live, we were all just waiting for him to take over the game. With his size and the way he moved with the ball, it looked like he had the ability to just turn it on and be like NBA level prospect. But I think he was just a little bit too lengthy and light. With that added size, I could definitely see him becoming some sort of kind of stretch player, especially if he can add a little bit more to his three ball, maybe shooting somewhere closer to what his brother's hitting from the three point range. The two of them with added size though, could be a very impressive pairing for Pitt, especially going into a junior year if they do come back for a third year. Six foot seven Richard Jr. forward, Williams Jeffress, returns after a foot injury kept him sidelined for all of last season and cost Pitt one of their best wing defenders. Jeffers has been cleared from that injury and will be back on the team in full capacity this fall. His sophomore year, the 21-22 season, he appeared in 31 games, making 16 starts. He averaged 3.3 points and 3.3 rebounds, but he became known as a solid, versatile defender. Pitt hoped to get him a medical redshirt so that he could retain all three years of remaining eligibility. And I do see him slotting in this year, starting at the two or backing up the three. We'll see how he comes it back from that injury though and how the lineup all shakes out. Six foot ten forward freshman Papa Conte has a physically imposing frame and good size, broad shoulders, a strong body, a reported seven foot four wingspan. He can be a dominant rebounder and active shot blocker. He rim runs well and is just starting to utilize that big body to steal easy buckets from inside. And he has made a lot of progress with his hands and reactions in the quick and catch finish situations. Conte has a good touch and footwork, but becomes less efficient when he's trying too hard to prove his face-up skill set. He has become a consistent free throw shooter and isn't incapable of knocking down an occasional open rhythm three, but too often picks and pops instead of rolling to the rim. He settles for tough twos in the mid post area or stops the ball with too many fakes and pivots trying to create his own shot. Defensively, he's physical in the post, fairly mobile at hedging ball screens for a player his size, albeit a true center and not overly switchable. Overall, he has good size, measurables, a college-ready body, and is an asset on the glass on the defensive end. His offense continues to develop, but he will likely need to have a more simplified role at the next level. I assume he'll slot in as a bench guy or a deep rotational player in the 4 and 5 next year, and we could see him really start to develop maybe towards the end of the year or going into the next. 6'7 senior forward Blake Henson returns for his second year of Pitt. 
He played 36 games last season, starting 35, while adding 15.3 points, 1.2 assists, and 6 rebounds a game, on 42% shooting from the field and 38 from 3. He was Pitt's leading scorer and rebounder in last year's NCAA tournament and went through the early stages of the NBA draft process but ultimately decided to return. It looks like a big amount of the feedback was that he needs to get into better shape. Overall, he's an, an above average athlete, a good scorer, and he's serviceable in the low post. He needs to improve his free throw shooting. Despite his scoring numbers, he can be kind of passive on the offensive end of the floor. He's a strong mobile combo guard who can score in a variety of ways. His three-point shooting definitely fits Cable's system, but as an older six-year player with NBA hopes, probably leaving him as a late second-round pick or undrafted free agent, this year will be a spot where he can start at the four for Pitt, maybe improve his chances at playing the next level, but if not, he'll certainly be set up to have a good last year of college. And finally, six foot eleven junior center Federico Federico. He returns after playing 35 games last season, starting 27 of them. He averaged 6.6 points and 5.3 rebounds a game while adding 58 blocks in the season. He doesn't shoot threes, and thanks to his inside game posted a 67% shooting percentage. He was born in Cairo, Egypt, and moved to Helsinki at a young age. He said it took some time to adjust to American basketball, especially at the high school level, since it was much more focused on one-on-one matchups than team-oriented ball in Europe. Federico, who wasn't even supposed to start last season, but he played really well. Federico looks like a classic big man, because he is. He's a rim protector, a good defensive guy. He can run the floor and finishes at the rim. Even though he started last year, I could see Guillermo Diaz-Graham competing for starts at the five this year. I'm not sure which guy will get the definitive start. It really will depend on how much mass Diaz-Graham has added. Either way, the competition between the two in practice should create two much better players for Pitt. While Pitt is getting more love than they were last year, they still aren't a top ACC team. Some pundits see Henson as possibly being projected as a first-team All-ACC player this year. And instead of being projected as a 14th team like last year, most people are coming in with Pitt around a 9 seed to start the year. When I look at the ACC, I see three groups. There's Duke, Miami, UNC in the top. Then there's a middle group of Clemson, NC State, Wake Forest, UVA, maybe FSU, and then there's everyone else. And then for Pitt, I kind of see them slotting in at the back end of that second group. And honestly, like the group there is in no order. I could see those teams finishing in any order. I could see NC State finishing anywhere from third all the way through eighth or ninth in the league. And same with UVA, U Wake Forest, Clemson, FSU. Pitt, most people have them going in at ninth. But with that group, really, it will just depend on injuries and Teams are just so different year to year now with the transfers. I feel like it's hard to say how players will work out in new systems until we actually see them on the court. And they outperformed expectations last season, so it is totally possible that they finish slightly higher or much higher than ninth in the ACC and see themselves dancing for the first time in a long time in back-to-back -back years. The trio of Johnson, Lowe, and Carrington lack experience at the collegiate level, but the talent is there, and all three were four-star recruits rated by 247 Sports for a reason. All three were ranked in the top 20 of their respective positions coming out of high school. To supplement the lack of experience in the backcourt, they did add senior guard Ishmael Leggett from Rhode Island through the transfer portal. And last season, the strength of the pit was the backcourt. This season, their frontcourt has enough talent to carry the team to success. Senior Blake Henson was all ACC third team last year, and he'll be leading the court. Junior center Federico Federico and sophomore forwards Guillermo and Jorge Diaz Graham all return, hopefully with much bigger frames. The three will have a full offseason to add weight and muscle to their frames. The Panthers will also see the return of senior forward Will Jeffress, who they missed all of last season. With Henson, Jeffress, and the Diaz Graham twins and Federico all returning, their front court is looking very solid going into camp. On paper, this is one of Pitt's best rosters in a long time, and fans should be optimistic about it. The only concern would be the lack of experience at the guard position, especially point guard, since that's usually what leads the offense, and unless they're truly elite, it'll take a while for them to get comfortable, especially in the ACC. Johnson hasn't seen action in over a year, and Lowe just graduated high school. Expecting either of them to lead the team, that's a tough ask. In the end, I think this could be a good season for Pitt. 
And for Jeff Campbell, it could get a lot of monkeys off his back in terms of questioning his ability to start to build his own legacy. As a Pitt fan, I would be excited for this season. But I'd also keep my expectations tempered. Last year, Pitt overexceeded. This year, they might just meet expectations, in which case you might see an NIT at the end of the year. But who knows? I kind of have a feeling this is going to be an up year for the ACC. Let's see how it goes.